Well, welcome everyone to uh, gin in the 21st century. Um, general discussion on sort of where gin is at the moment and um, where potentially where it will go in the future. Always a bit of um, you know speculation, but I think it's uh, interesting. We're going to do um, a combination of uh, a couple of bit, uh, questions that I've prepared. I'm sorry, I'm David Smith, by the way. I'm a, a writer and consultant on gin from the UK. Um, so we'll do a couple of um, points just to get us started, and then we'll take questions or points uh, from the floor. Um, so we'll just start if um, we want to start with a client at the end. If you just introduce yourself and your uh, distillery, and also how you like to drink your gin. Oh, yeah. In quantities. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Carl Keegan from Sun Face Boots. Um, I like to try gin more like a sipper, like most people would a whiskey, just to really see what's going on in it. Can we talk about our gin now, or do we do all that later? No, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, my name is Timo Marshall, I'm from Spirit Works Distillery in Sonoma County, Sebastopol in Sonoma County. Um, and I, I actually like my gins I, uh, as sippers as well, but um, I tend to drink them more in gin and tonics, so it just seems to be where it goes. Hello. My name's Anne, I work for a company called Jensen's Gin from London in the UK. We have a distillery in the southeast in a place called Bermondsey. Um, and I like my gin in martinis, the drier and bigger the better. Hi, I am Melissa Katrinsic from uh, Durham Distillery in Durham, North Carolina. And uh, I'm trying to think if there's something different I can say. I really enjoy the Martinez cocktail right now. I think that is amazing. Amazing old farm based cocktail. And then the other one that I would always say is you really can't go wrong with a straight up with a twist. I'm Dan Shore. I'm the founder of the Cotswolds Distillery, which is in Cotswolds in the English countryside. Um, we started producing in September. Um, we're doing gin, but we're doing also a lot of single malt whiskey. Um, so, as a whiskey guy, definitely neat is how I would drink the gin, just like a whiskey. Um, although, um, we have a very nice cocktail called the Gin Fizzon, which is basically gin with everything we don't use uh, after using all our citrus um, to make the gin. So, great for the client. Thank you very much. So, I mean, what's interesting there, and certainly something that I've noticed um, in the time that I've been far more into gin, um, is this: there seems to be an increasing trend towards drinking it neat. Is there anyone here in the, the audience, I mean, you, does anyone here drink it? Neat sort of a vein show of hands. So, is it, so like five years ago, there would be like maybe one person, and everyone would be like, drink it neat, and that's kind of a find that quite interesting. Would from the from the panel's point of view, is that trend that you've been seeing as well? And anyone have a particular reason as to why you think that might be the case? <laughs> I think there's a slight movement away from uh, when people go and drink martinis in bars. There's a slight movement away from the commercial, neutral aspect of vodka that you can find out there, and people are beginning to want more and more character to uh, the martinis that they're choosing. They're, they're being um, a little bit, uh, a little more picky. I would say. So there's definitely a movement now towards people ordering gin and they order martinis, uh, and that move away from vodka. <coughs> okay. Any, anyone else with thoughts on that? I was just thinking it's, it's probably just because there's a much greater proliferation of gin. There's so many different types that everyone can find one they, they like to drink meat. You're not just sort of, you know, there's a greater education of the public about the taste of gin and the appreciation of gin, and therefore people are understanding that it is a spirit that you can drink meat. Okay. I'm going to differ, I guess, a little bit in that. I think that um, the reason that so many of you, many of us, drink it that way is because we're all sort of spirit sports, and we, we like, you know, we, we love the spirit that it's about, but when we go out to shows and we give people tastes and eat of the gin, um, I'd say 95% of the people say, I've never had any gin. Um, and so that's kind of tough, because you have to design a gin which you want people to drink meat, but also it's got to stand up to mixer, because that's just the way people, I think, still are going to drink it. Maybe that will change it. But what's the response that you tend to get from people when they are drinking it neat? Because I've never, I've never yeah. 
jump to meet Jim before. What, what's I, that they're, they're completely blown away. I mean, people's attitude, I think, historically towards gin is it's something that's kind of factory made. It's something that's a little bit strange. I want to get it in that glass to get something in the top of it as quick as possible. But when you actually, I think it goes with craft um, that you know they're more willing. People who are interested in what we do are more willing to try things, open up to do it, and are usually surprised. And hopefully, there'll be a bit of a, a conversion. But how long? That yeah, I guess one of the pluses is if you're uh, more people are drinking at me, they might be drinking more of it as well. So you sell more bottles, I guess, yeah. one, one plus. Um, I think that's certainly something that, that I've noticed is uh, because there are more styles and more are uh, suitable. And certainly um, with, with, I guess, with some distilleries in the UK and well, no, with distilleries in the UK and some distilleries in the US, um, there's a uh, proponents to, uh, I believe the term is sell the sizzle, which is basically you give someone a little taste and then after they've tasted it, then they might go ahead and, and buy a bottle. And you know, giving people a little taste of gin comic is much harder than giving them a little taste of gin. So I guess that sort of fits in with what you're saying is when you're making it, one of the considerations is if it tastes good neat, then actually in, in some situations it's going to be easier to sell as well. So. Good, okay. Um, so, in, um, so a little, like a few sort of uh, number bits. We, I was uh, checking with, uh, with the ADI's main database thing, and um, apparently the count for gin producers in the US is about 269 at the moment. Probably a little bit more than that, and there's probably quite a few still waiting to come online. And there's a, certainly almost every state has a gin that it's uh, producing now. Uh, in the UK, last year we had more new. Uh, gin distilleries opened that had opened in the last five years, so that was kind of like a real uh, huge growth. Whereas, I, my understanding, sort of in the US, it's a little bit steady, it's about thirty percent a year. That's a little bit of sort of of, um, of where we are now. Um, so, oh, if anyone had a question from the floor, I'll uh, wave one of those in. Does anyone have a particular question? Oh, yeah. I'm not a distiller. Tell me what gin is. As a novice, what is gin? <laughs> well, in our case, we're using um, an NGS base. We put five botanicals in, we distill them all separately. Um, then, well, some's in maceration, some's in the vapor path, and then distill, and blend them all back to make a wonderful gin. Um, but everybody has a different method of making it, so I think we could go down the line and see different methods of others. I think uh, the definition here in the U.S. is that uh, it should have a predominant character of juniper, and that will be the defining factor of gin, as opposed to it being an aquavit or uh, some other kind of herbal spirit that's distilled. There are various different ways to produce gin. You can just macerate uh, botanicals in your in, in your base, whatever that base might be, um, or you can and just literally a tea bag style kind of thing, bathtub gin style. Um, or you can uh, macerate it in the gin and then put it over, that's called distilled gin. Uh, you can distill all the botanicals separately and then combine them after the fact, uh, that's called a compound gin. Um, or you can put those botanicals in the vapor path in what's commonly called a gin basket within the process and have vapor extraction of your botanicals. Some people use very specific methods within this uh, and some people combine them uh, like one of those. And we combine some of those methods as well at Spirit Works Distillery. Uh, but our, our gin is a distilled gin. Yeah. Um, Jensen, yeah, we, uh, we make very traditional distilled gin. All the botanicals go into a pot. We use around, well, we make two different gins, a dry and an old tom. They both have between 80 and 5 botanicals in them. Um, it's a basic pot still that we use. There's no cakes. Um, it's a really simple process, really. Um, I guess uh, the point to be made is that even if you only have juniper as your botanical, it's still a gin. You don't need anything else in there. So I'm in a, a little bit of a uh, time period. So we are, are right about to have two gins come onto the market. And we've been working on this for over two years. Um, but I'd say I'm, we're in the American South. It's a little bit of a polarizing spirit. Um, some people will come at us and say, well, why gin? And not from a positive direction. Um, and we really say, well, you know, fine gins are like fine wines. You, either the variety, the layers of complexity, what goes into a gin is, is really a work of art. 
So it's not just the process, it's the botanical selection that you make. And, and for us, it's, it's a passionate affair of trying to really have something that will resonate with consumers so that they feel a new awakening to gin. Um, we've had a lot of people also say, well, okay, well, I got sick on gin, and I never want to go back to this stuff. And, um, and we're like, well, just give us a try. Give us a try, because we, we really are, are pretty certain we're going to wake you up to a whole new category of gins. And that's really our goal when we get, we get live. So we should have our gins on shelf in June. And we're in label review right now, and uh, we're doing a two separate process. We actually have, our, uh, if you, anyone has seen the Mueller still down on the floor, that is our still. It is actually our still. So we're so excited that that's going to move over to our distillery shortly. Um, but we're doing a combination of that as well as vacuum. Um, and it's going to be back blended at the end. So it's a layering of that complexity of spirit with the botanicals. Ours is a distilled gin as well. Um, we, have a, we have actually we have a separate set of whiskey stills, uh, which are made by First Sight. They're big Scottish pot stills. And then we've got a Holstein uh, still, 500 liter Holstein still, which is a pot and column hybrid still. And we're just using the pot for the, the gin distillation. So all of our nine botanicals go into the uh, into the pot and, and are distilled with the uh, with the neutral spirit that we buy in simply because again that's not you know, we tasted through lots of neutral spirits to find one where we found you know the taste really sort of made a bit of a difference in the quality um, but at the end of the day um, for me it was still sort of a bit of a commodity and not something given how many other things we were doing that we wanted to put a lot of time into is making making the base um, and I admit I probably came at this a little bit uh, from the point of view of a whiskey guy looking for some way to fund this uh, operation for three years, because in Europe you can't sell anything uh, with the name whiskey until three years has gone by. Um, but um, we spent about two months before the distillery was actually uh, ready doing um, flavor you know, work and doing recipe development, and we actually distilled through 150 different botanicals, um, which left us with a pretty huge wall of um, different botanicals and sort of we call it our liquid library. Um, but we got a sense of all the possibilities. And that really changed my attitude towards towards gin a lot. I think um, I think it can be a lot more. I think it may actually be bigger than our our, our whiskey. Uh, you know the palette that's available to you in different flavors, and you don't you can use different bases. Our second gin is going to have a, a, a malt a combination malt uh, our own malt spirit and neutral spirit base. So it'll be a little bit more like a chamber style gin. Um, you can age gin, and of course there's the old toms, and so there's there's really a wide variety, and that's I think what's great about what's happening in, in gin now with craft is. So I've got a question about um, all the various different ways we're treating gin as a style. We've begun to take so many different botanicals and different approaches. We're uh, uh, barrel finishing them and, and literally changing them into almost non-gin products. And I'm kind of wondering what risk you think we have. If there's anything we need to mitigate to keep the, the gin category defined as gin, or is it fine just to let it run wild? And how far do we want it to go? This is quite, uh, I, thought, I, was, I thought this might come up, so we'll let everyone answer. We're, uh, we're craft distillers, <laughs> so let the crafts go, do you know what I mean? Like, be creative, do, like, do amazing things with the products that you can. Find, a, find your niche and find other things that make your distillery yours and, and run with it. I know, Jason, that you're doing lots of experiments with different, uh, putting gin in different wood and different finishes. And, uh, and that's really important to reach out and see how far you can push it, where you're going to go. It's really, I mean, that's the point of being a craft to sell it to me. I would reiterate that. Sorry. Okay, okay. I, I, okay. I, I just reiterate what Timo was saying, that I think it's up to us to go for it, you know, try something different. I think we've heard yesterday in many of the talks that the big guys are looking to us to come up with something completely different. Maybe we'll, you know, reinvent the whole category with thousands of different gins in there. I don't know. Our gin's very regional, it's in New Mexico. There's not much that grows in New Mexico, so we've got a small pot to pick from, but it'd be great to see every state trying to do their own regional stuff, I think. I guess I was thinking, yes, while, while it's great to experiment and come up with um, an incredible, and obviously the very loose definition of gin means that we can, um, when is a gin not a gin and is it just a botanically flavored vodka? Well, there is there is that but there's that question, and I think that's kind of the. It's interesting because, and, and you, I will come to you guys as well. But um, I think, like in certainly in the UK, this is a question that comes out a lot more. There seems to be far more traditionalists out there. But then the craft movement is a little bit behind where 
the US is, and in the US there's a much more a greater embrace of this. But what I've noticed with some of now that some of the craft products have started to come online in the UK, they are more out there and less traditional. And I think one of the big issues, certainly I think, is because you know, from a craft distilling point of view, you're never going to be able to compete with Beefeater and, and Tanqueray and things like that in terms of consistency or, most importantly, price. So why make a gin that just tastes like Tanqueray when, you, you know, you need to differentiate yourself? And I think that's one of the things. Uh, and, and something from speaking to consumers and distillers that I often find is people will say, well, I didn't think I liked gin, but I like your gin. And I guess I would imagine all of you guys have had someone say, I don't think I like gin, but I like your gin. And that's kind of, I think that's a, a common thing. Uh, is, there, is, there, yeah. is there a potential way of kind of nailing that down in terms of saying, um, you know, being scientific about it and saying, okay, gin is predominantly juniper flavor. That's the predominant flavor. That's the, that's the criteria, that's the overriding criteria. Could you be scientific and say, you know, the parts per million of flavor compounds or something that, that <coughs> you know, that, that you should aspire to, or a range that you should aspire to from, from a June point of view, and that would be a way of kind of defining the stuff that meets Jane and doesn't meet Jane. Yeah, so to give a slight bit of background to, to many people that might not be familiar with it, in the <coughs> European Union, that is part of the definition for gin. Um, my understanding is when the rules are written, that it was originally meant to be something like you suggested, but then as all, many of these rules vested interests say, well actually maybe if it's X amount of oil uh, from the juniper, the juniper we use is maybe a little bit older, a little bit less with the oil in, and I think that that's how it got diluted with distillers from a particular country, but we won't go into that too much. But um, Dan, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I, I, do, I don't think that the label is, I mean I remember there was this meeting in London it was two years ago, um, yeah. uh, like 40 people in a room talking about what is London dry gin, and nobody could sort of come to an agreement after two hours or an hour of talking about it. Um, and I think the most important thing, I mean, probably everybody in here, if you're in this business, you're in it because of your passion for good spirits, and, and you probably have a good palate, or you know what you like in a way, and I guess my advice would be just make something that you like and that you would want to drink. That was what drove me. I mean, that's my driving thing behind the whiskey um, and, and, and behind the gin as well. It's got to be something that you know you, you like and you want to drink. And if you want to make sure that your tastes aren't a little bit off the, the chart of it, what we did was we, we set up a focus group. And so we uh, each of our three distillers um, who worked for a month going through different recipes came up with their top four. And we took all 12 of them and we took them out to a lab and they had set up a five-person panel. And they tasted through them, narrowed it down to the top one for each of the three guys, tasted those blind against a couple of commercial gins. And uh, the one that we went with was one that, that, that won, which you know, thankfully came out pretty much uh, aligned with the kinds of genes that I like. So I kind of hope it, but yeah, I'd say think what you want. Well, I think um, we're a little bit different in that you really, in the US, I have a sense that you really want to own our home turf, right? You want to make sure that your local community embraces what you're producing. So. We are going to look at some experimental, like seasonal blends, um, hoping that North Carolina actually gets on with modern times on our legislation soon. Uh, but if, if that doesn't happen, then we really also want to make sure that we worked with local bartenders. I mean, your mixologist, they want to know what kind of profile you're going to produce on your gin. And uh, we've talked with them several times about, okay, this is what we're exploring. What do you guys think? What are your consumers looking for? What are you? What are you thinking about the next cocktail menu? Um, and of course, you don't want to be at the, their beck and call, but they want to feel a part of it. Um, and so as we get further along into our scale-up batching, we're going to invite them in. We're going to say, this is the process we're going through. This is what we've made a decision on for the profile. What do you guys think? And uh, we've got about six bartenders, top-notch bartenders in our area that are so excited. And I would very much encourage you guys to reach out and see what your community wants from you on Jen. I think, um, so just for me, from my point of view of trying the gins and judging different competitions and stuff, um, and, and having chatted about this concept quite a lot, I think, for me, it's gin as long as there's some juniper in there somewhere. It doesn't have to be the most dominant flavour, but as long as it's discernible, then I think it's still gin. And I think if you can't taste any juniper at all, and it's not discernible, then there is a question as to why you would want to label it gin. And there aren't, there aren't that many gins that I um, 
think that where you can't discern them these days, uh, the June plan. And there's a lot of American craft stuff that might be more contemporary in style, but there's still some of that coming through. And I think as long as that's the case, that's absolutely fine. Because this idea of predominant is, to me, that suggests the main flavor. And while I know I might be going out on a limb here, but like things like beefy, that's a very citrusy gin, you know? So I don't think that's all just about juniper. And there are other well-known and established gyms that are just the same, so I think that's my view. But um, if anyone's got some points, because I know it's quite a, a big issue from specifically about this, this topic, and then we can come on to more questions. Yeah, uh -huh. Yeah, I wanted to just kind of go a little further on what Melissa said. We're kind of in the same ballpark here in the same state. <coughs> but I come from a brewing background, um, and I've watched, um, you know, 12, 13 years ago in North Carolina, the only beer you could find was advertised on the side of a NASCAR. Um, and so we've progressed quite a bit now that we can, people are finding out that beer actually tastes like something. Uh, and, and, and so the craft industry has, um, be, is blossoming because people are finding out that there's more than just one flavor of beer. Um, everybody makes an IPA uh, and everyone is different but it's still an IPA, and there's some small boundaries uh, in the craft brewing industry that hold it to that. But the beauty is, and whenever I travel, I always look for somebody local, and I try their IPA, because I'm an IPA guy, um, and enjoy what they've brought to the table. Um, and with us as craft distillers, we have to jump on that same wagon, because we cannot compete with Budweiser. Uh, we have to compete um, for the public that wants something different. They want to taste something. I get those same things with our gin. Wow, I would never ever drink a gin. Uh, but this is pretty good. Yeah. So I, I think that's where the craft industry has to settle into is being an artist as well as um, a producer. And I think picking up on, on your point there, I had your gin by the way, and I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. But um, <laughs> was, um, I think, and as I was, I was um, discussing with people uh, yesterday, when I first started writing about gin, I think I was amazed when I got to 100 gins that I tried. And now it's like over 600 and I kind of stopped counting. And I think if we didn't have the innovation that so many people here on the panel are doing, then I don't think that the gin would, gin would be growing as it, what, as it were, because if everyone was just making, you know, just a very standard classic style, I just don't think it would bring in the imagination and the creation. And now, with some of the amazing things that are going on with um, in, wood interaction with gin, um, that's now that's that's really getting into an exciting time. So, any other points on the specifically on the juniper and when is gin not gin kind of thing? Yeah. Well, I just have a question. I mean, you know, gin kind of, as far as I know, originated in, in Europe, and. Uh, is there any talk from the big guys over there about, you know, owning that brand, that name, and not being allowed, allowing anybody else to use that name? Just like Scotch, can't name Scotch in this country if you make a Scotch, can't name it that. There was a, um, uh, there was a discussion which, uh, which uh, Dan alluded to earlier, which was about potential geographic um, protected status for London gin, but you couldn't. You basically couldn't do it because it's already a, it's right. so in the EU it's not there's a London writing which is about how it's produced as opposed to how it's um, uh, as opposed to where it's made you know and so because that's already fixed in and it's I think it's 2008 that those rules came into effect they were when people were looking at it they were essentially told it's not going to happen <coughs> our discussion was about whether or not there could be some sort of mark or some association where there'd be some logo which meant that would give it some sort of protection, like a fair trademark or something like that. Um, but essentially, I think the distillers would rather just go on their own. They felt confident enough to differentiate themselves about that. And there's even, I think there's a gin that's made in London that is a London dry gin, doesn't say it on there because they're more interested in saying that they're distilled in London. So that's a specific thing. Would some people like to do it? Yeah, but I think it's, it's gone, it should have been done. 30, 40, 50 years ago, I think it's, and in all honesty, so much trade is done with the, with the US and, and all over the world, I just think it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it couldn't be done now, so, yeah. Are there London uh, gin distilleries that are actually outside of London? 
Yeah, uh, oh, well, the Make London Dry Gin? Yeah, <coughs> the perfect traditional one, so like the Bee Theater and Tankery and Gordon's and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, well, well, Tankery, for example, is in Scotland, but um, I mean, one off the top of my head, very good example of a very classic um, gin is uh, in, it's like in the heart of Denver, in Colorado, actually. Yeah. So that's an example. Okay, um, yep. Uh, to uh, our panelists, and maybe following a little after Melissa's comment about reaching out to bartenders. Gin is so flexible, you can change the recipe anytime. You can put someone's favorite flavors in it. Have any of you uh, entertained or actually made custom gins for some of your customers, <coughs> a bar or a restaurant chain or a chef or anyone like that? And if not, uh, why not? Anyone on that one? I mean, we get approached all the time in London. We get asked all the time for restaurants, hotels, bars want their own unique gin, um, and we haven't done it yet. One of the things we have discussed make, doing is working with bartenders and doing unique infusions, so if they use our gin, we'll come up with a, a herbal infusion that they can have on their back bar, and that can be their signature gin. I think we don't need to make gins for other people, I'd rather sell them my gin and have my gin on their back bar, rather than the gin that's got their branding on and something that's different. I could probably answer that question on the beer business. Uh, the reason is that they wouldn't be buy that one person wouldn't be buying enough for the expense and time it takes to make another label, getting the TT approval, and then making the run. It just probably wouldn't cost. It wouldn't be cost effective. Um, we uh, we have made a couple of gins for a couple of restaurant chains. Um, but they came about purely serendipitously in the sense that we spent a lot of time, we make one gin um, and uh, we always knew we were just going to make one gin. Uh, Melissa earlier alluded to the laws changing and as laws change then you can become more creative because you can sell experimental um, and creative processes a lot easier in smaller batches. Um, but we make one gin and as we were developing that gin um, we made several other recipes, some of which were fantastic, uh, and we didn't know what to do with those particular gins. And uh, we tasted them on a few folk, and um, there was one chain in San Francisco in particular that wanted uh, to pick up one of our gins and put their label on it, um, which we let them do. But um, it was it's it is a very difficult experience because of having to go through new labels and. Uh, new formulas for the TTP, etc., etc. Uh, another serendipitous thing that happened with that gin was that they didn't want all of it, so we put the other half in a barrel to store it. And then six months later, they came back and they wanted an aged gin. So <laughs> actually, it's not quite true. They came back to bottle their first batch of gin and said, "We just happen to have your other gin in this barrel. Do you want to taste it?" Um, so that's the only reason why we've done other gins. Uh, it becomes very expensive to start experimenting. People can come up to you and say, I'd like a gin that has this sort of profile, whatever, whatever. And it's such an expensive prospect to actually get the notes that they want exactly right that um, it becomes, uh, it's not cost effective. Yeah, so I think um, creating uh, different experimental products for sale is probably not something that in North Carolina will ever let us do. Um, but We've really tried to figure out, okay, what can we do, since we are just a gin and liqueur distillery, what can we do to get excitement out there? And so one of the, the key things that we would like to do with our consumers is have special uh, you know, one day or two day courses where they can come in and they can help us do a run, they can see what goes into it, and then we will have all of the individual distillates and they can do a blend themselves and test it out. Now, unfortunately, they can't take that home. Other states, I'm sure that you have better laws and you could probably do that, but um, but we really want them to feel that hands-on. And I don't know if any of you took, or here last year for Seattle, but Clay had an individual distillate between vapor and maceration and compound and everything broken out. And it was fantastic. Because it was only then that you could nose it as well as feel it on the palate of how all the different oils, as well as even just the different aging. So a, a juniper that had gone bad versus a fresh juniper. And so it, the nosing, I think, will really excite consumers if they can do it. We, um, on the topic of school, we, um, we, we run a gin, we, we offer a gin school, basically, um, where if somebody wants, we got approached by someone local who wanted to give her husband a 50th birthday present. So we, uh, we said for, for 1,500 pounds, 
which is $2,250, um, so a fair bit. Um, you come in, spend a, an afternoon with our head distiller, and because we've got this botanical library, it's an easy way of tasting through everything you can possibly do. And then there's sort of a guided you know, process of, of putting a gin together, initially using um, those, those pre-distilled uh, botanicals. Um, and we advise you know, what, which are the base ones, which are the important ones to have, how many, let's say five to 10 botanicals, and then based on our recipe that they approve, we then go ahead and do a run on a little 35 liter still that we've got, which gets 40 bottles, and it actually comes out to be about the same price per bottle as uh, it would cost them to buy our ready-made gin. Um, yeah, how many people want 40 bottles of gin? I'm not sure, but one of the nice things about that is, is that it, unlike doing it for a bar, you're getting your revenue from 40 bottles right away rather than taking a year to sell for you know, 40 bottles. Yeah. I think, I mean, and again, uh, this is oh, it's more of a UK type of thing, but I've certainly seen there's at least three distilleries, and there probably is more where they actually have small, like one liter pot stills, and you can go in there and make your own gin, but that is a very much a legal requirement sort of thing, and it's quite a fun thing to do uh, as an engagement thing, but like it's whether or not individual states will allow that sort of thing, I guess maybe won't, but it's just a, as a, a little um, side there. Um, any other questions? Yeah, the back. Yeah, um, the mixology movement that is very powerful in the marketplace right now is clearly a great driver for the gin uh, production group among us, and I wanted to see if you guys have a particular mixology strategy and or do you have specific drinks that as you prototype your gins you you think well it's got to taste great in a Negroni or we're dead in the water. Uh, Anne, are you happy to do, take that one? Or? Do we have a mixology strategy? Um, yeah. I think I think Jensen's is slightly unusual in the fact that it's been around for 10 years now so we're quite an established gin although our distillery is quite young. And when it first started up, it was Christian Jensen's hobby. So he never meant it to be a commercial product. He, he's just a bit crazy. And um, he made this gin with a third party distiller and bottled a pallet load and it sat in his front room for a while. Um, and he used to drink in a bar on Bermondsey Street, which is in South East London. And one day he just took his gin in and said that when I come in for cocktails, can you make the cocktails using my gin? And that's essentially where the company started. So we haven't ever really had a mixology strategy, but it is definitely the bartenders that drove the company growth to begin with because it was very organic and it grew from there. Um, I think, uh, well certainly because we have an old Tom gin, I think it's important that you, um, people are often scared by an old Tom gin, they don't know what to do with it. So we very, a lot of our strategy around talking around old Tom gin is through educating, through showing how it can be used in very classic cocktails and you know what it sort of adds to a very classic drink. Um, I mean, it's definitely important, definitely important to talk to the bartenders and to educate them about how your gin works. For me, it's like a, a necessary evil kind of thing um, because um, being a whiskey, I don't know, I, I relate much better to off-premises than on-premises. That's just an age thing, maybe too. I mean, I leave it to like I mean, the distillers are all like you know, they all be my kids, um, and and they they know the bartenders and I mean you know our head distiller. You can go to any town in the world and know the top ten hit bars or whatever, and and that's it's good to to do that. But I, I just I'm and I wonder because we're still very new at this whether the volume really uh, goes through the on-premises. Um, it would seem to me just intuitively that. What's really going to drive the volume is off-premises, um, and then the question: Do you need the on-premises to drive the off-premises? Which is what I've heard said quite a bit. But in in a, in in my experience, that hasn't really been the case. Um, you know, exports has been driving a lot of uh, our volume and, and and multiples. You know, with big chains or whatever. Um, so you know, yeah, I guess it's important. I think especially in a white spirit versus brown spirit. But um, and we do it. And we do suggested serves and cocktails. Um, but I still think. Um, you're going to get your volume and off premises. Okay. I've got a question here. Was your point on this or was yeah. it a separate question? Yeah. It's on this. Okay. Uh, Mark, we had this allergy background. We've come to this building. I have to that. Um, but uh, I'd say that maybe from the mixology standpoint is maybe a mistake. Um, there's tons of different flavors, tons of different tastes. There's tons of people that, it's, from my marketing standpoint, if you play to a focus group, you're going to vanilla out your product. And either way, you've got to stand out. You might alienate some people, but the, the joy of mixology is taking your spirit and experimenting with it and see what I can do transforming cocktails with it. 
And that's what a lot of these colleges have fun with me to do. And that's why we really respect them. That's why I'm really trying to learn more about doing this, because I want to take your products and your tools and create my own expression with it. And so I think that as artisans, as you know, craftsmen, you need to keep yourselves independent and focused on your own vision, your own goals. Um, and it's really smart to ask our friends, you know, what you think, what you do, but don't play to every bartender you meet. You know what I mean? Maybe go through your local bartenders. Don't vanilla your product. You know, express yourself. Be vibrant. Be, be, that's what Jim Hansen is, you know. Poof! You know, it's a vibrant expression of your, of yourself. I guess you hear that stuff. Like, as, as when, you know, when a bartender gets a particular product and they get very excited about it, if the distiller's a bit prescriptive about how they think it should be used, that's going to quell some of that excitement and creativity, I guess. So that's... Uh, no, not exactly. I mean, we're, I mean, I get excited when you're excited about your product. There's so many people that come to me to make cocktails that they're coming to me like, man, can you help me out make some of this? I'm like, no, I'm not going to help you make something with it. Bring me something good product for me, and I'll get excited about it. You know, come and tell me why it's great, and I'll use those notes that you point out. You can sell us really easily, just like we can sell consumers. The bartender can sell consumers on anything. You know, they ask me who's an expert. Well, I'm asking you as an expert, what notes do you have in there? You know, how do you want this expressed? How can I play with this? And then once I see that, I start to like, well, maybe I'll have you know, my own little infusions or my own little tincture of that. But we want to work with the, you know, spirit vision, because we think you guys are the coolest people in the room. You know, we're using all your stuff to make our shit, and you're making, you're paying our rent. So, <laughs> okay. I would agree with this fellow here. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're pulling him at the bottom. No, actually, what I was going to say is, I think it's. I can't with anybody, yeah, that's my job. Um, I, I think one, one thing that's important to say is, you are sort of go to their office, so to speak, and they are, you know, listen to this guy, he's passionate about it, you know. They can sell it better than you can, because they're there day in, day out, people are going to meet them, so just let them have at it, and mix it up the way they like, for a mixology strategy, or just let the bottom go, you know. Stop. And then, uh, gentlemen, we a question here? Yes, um, um, I get the, the opportunity to test the many of my clients are the only to test that what you in the United States. Uh, one thing I wanted to say in regard to Jim initially before my question is, um, I'm originally from England, so it's nice to have some fellow Brits here in the audience. I think with Jim in particular, you have a lot to offer the craft movement over here, whereas we've, we've heard about the craft brewing movement, there's a lot of craft brewing information coming from the United States to Britain. So I have a question about regulation in general. It does relate to the flavors or the mixes. Um, I'd like to ask you, how you test for alcohol in the United Kingdom, because with a lot of the oils, and we, um, as a craft distilling industry and the craft brewing industry, we are regulated by an agency that have members who have no clue about alcohol, no clue about distilled spirits, and, but what we're seeing when we do official distillation methods for alcohol over here is those gin oils and gin flavors are interfering with the alcohol measurement and we're not getting reliable alcohol values. So I'm wondering how that's handled in Britain and whether uh, you have any experience with particular flavors. Um, and I'll just put it into context, we did some distillations, and I like to taste the distillate, and we taste the residuals, what's left afterwards. When I've done gin distillations, I think it was Collins uh, on, on the team there, that might have been yours, I tasted the distillate afterwards, and I taste the gin. I taste the residuals, it tastes like pure water. So we have to ask, what is happening with all these oils and all these flavorings to interfere with the alcohol? So it relates to the general topic about making different mixtures, uh, different wonderful beverages. How are we going to get a micro alcohol value to satisfy the people? <laughs> <laughs> I use a hydrometer, <laughs> so I don't really have much more to add to it. I mean, I've never, I've never had a problem with my gins. Um, I've actually never really been audited by HMRC, but I've, I've always just used a hydrometer. Do they have a set of regulations, though, that uh, to, to guide you? That's the thing that we don't have in the United States. It's very difficult finding out exactly how to test these beverages for the guys that are doing it on their own. You know, we, we have the facilities to do that. We'd like to teach them to be able to do it at least on a routine basis, and then for an official sample, send it into a lab such as ours, you know, for the final. But, you know, how, how is it regulated in England, and, and has that been an issue generally? Uh, um, is it clear for you? It sounds like not. No. Are there any instructions? No, um, if I'm really honest, I googled it. Okay. <laughs> when I started out, 
um, and there's a lot of information online. I then spoke to other distillers. There are strict rules about um, keeping track of um, alcohol, obviously, as it goes to your distillery, and you have to be, I can't quite remember the exact accuracy you have to have it within. Um, and they do check, but I think I've got British standard hydrometers and hydrometer tables, and as long as you're using those, then HMRC are happy. Okay. Um, one of the other things I was quite interested to ask the panel about, which is kind of a two-part question, um, one is um, what changes they have seen in the, and I know not, no, not everyone's been in the industry for sort of five years, but in the last few years, sort of what things have they noticed changing with the consumers and the way that business is done, and, and potentially a little bit of thinking of what they might sort of predict might happen um, sort of in the future. What's the, what's the trend that they're seeing with gin and gin consumption and those sorts of things? <laughs> That's a really, a really tough question because most of us are, I mean, uh, for us, for example, the only trends that I can look at are the trends from my particular areas or for, for where my markets are, kind of thing. It's very, I think, to look at global trends, um, I mean, we can all, it, there's very obvious signs about the rise of um, gin, say, in, in Spain and, and uh, in Europe as a whole, and so many more gin houses, so many more. Uh, different and new types of gin coming out, all the, the rise of tonics and the rise of um, craft tonics and different styles of tonics moving away from just sugared water. Um, that it's, I think it's very hard to look at global trends. I think I was reading somewhere that actually overall um, uh, global sales of gin have declined recently, but um, that's actually partly to do because in the Philippines, which is the largest consumer of gin on the planet, um, they have started, a lot of their consumer base has started moving on to uh, other products such as whiskey. Um, and so uh, of their effect overall globally has shown a decline in the sale of gin. Whereas here in the US, uh, sales of gin, I think last year they took an, an extra 2% of the market share. So I think here in the US we're going to see uh, a growth in gin, certainly in, um, certainly in San Francisco. There are a couple of bars opening up this year which are specifically gin bars, and that's, that, that's gonna be their focus. Um, and that hasn't, that hasn't happened before, so uh, we're pretty thrilled to see such a focus being put on, um, on the craft of gin. I predict a bright future for gin. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think we've got a progression of palate happening in gin. So if you look at the latest data over the last year or two years, the progression is people are understanding that the value gins have their place, but as they get older, they're really moving up to the premiums, to the super premiums of gin. And that is the progression of palate that happened in craft brewing, it's happening in whiskey, and now we've moved into it with gin. And I think that overall for the category, it's gonna be fantastic, because we're all gonna be pushing each other to make the best possible gins, um, if, if it's a passion of love, and we wanna make you know, amazing uh, different complexities and using different bases, you know, the apples to the grapes to the red wheat to the blends. I mean, either, the sky's the limit on what kind of, of palette and gin we want to go ahead and explore. And I think the consumers are starting, there. we had to hold their hand a little bit, but they're starting to now say, wow, this whole category really has some great opportunities and, and some really neat new, um, like the smoke gin, you know, we've got smoke gin, barrel gin, uh, you know, old toms. It's just, and now you can see naturally sweetened old to um, toms in the U.S. You know, so uh, we're excited, clearly. <laughs> I think um, the rise of sort of visitor center, people interested enough in gin to come out and, and, and go see Bombay Sapphire, just opened up a huge, new, uh, incredible uh, distillery sort of visitor center. Uh, in the UK, um, I think be here. Yeah, it was a big down bomb last year. Yeah, and uh, and that's going to kind of continue, I think, because sort of yeah, the destination is showing people going out to to see how things were made, and, and uh, in that Bombay, they're going to have uh, temperate zones where various botanicals are grown, big greenhouses. It's uh, it's, it's pretty cool stuff. So that will continue. Um, in Europe, we found. Um, definitely pick up in Northern Europe in, in gin, which is kind of nice to see. You know, probably our biggest uh, export market is Germany. Um, and, uh, and one thing a distributor uh, in Italy said to me the other day was that all he was looking for in gin was U.S. gin. So um, U.S. gin is getting a name in, in 
Europe. So, you know. Anyone else? Thoughts think, on that? I think you're actually going to see an understanding of the categorizations of gin, you know, the smoke gin, the barrel aged gin. Now everybody says, well, there's London Dry and the rest. You know? yeah. And there's people like yourself who are doing a good job of sort of defining, and this organization here. Yeah. That they now categorize in how they judge them. They have to. I mean, there's so much more going on in a barrel as the all the botanicals. They've got an unfair advantage if you put them all in the same category. Yeah. I think the amount of judging that we all want to see uh, going on to, you know, how do we stack it stack up against the rest is sort of forcing that and the fact that there's now at least that eight hundred distilleries here. Well, yeah, I've got eight hundred different perspectives. There's gonna be a category categorization. And like you're saying, on, on with, with, the, with the case on h uh, I mean, I remember like three or four years ago, there was like six or seven, and now there's like 50 or 60 or something like that. And you're almost even starting to see subcategorization within, um, uh, even within h because you've kind of got like the standard sort of oak things, and then you've got people that are doing peat barrels and stuff like that, and ex Applejack and, and far beyond some very interesting things that are going on. One, one distiller is doing, uh, a, doing a double wood aged gin, which is uh, European oak and American pecan. So that's kind of, you know, so that really is. And that, I think that hooks into the, the trend, which we kind of identified earlier, of this sipping gin. And, I mean, certainly from, from when I speak to people, and my thoughts are that this trend which I think there has been for people to drink gin on its own is probably going to continue. That's my, I, mean, I don't know if the distillers think so as well, but that's from what I've seen, that seems to be the case. Yeah. Um, I have a question, it might be a bit controversial, but um, the, you know, I think you guys have all, and everybody in the room is aware that, that gin is very much it's rising as long as it's, it's happening just about now. But for me, it smells a bit like the, 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 the rising vodka and the pattern that gone through with vodka in the past decade or so. Um, we're seeing the decline of vodka now, we know it's still doing quite well. But it became very ubiquitous, very generic, and it also sort of became a, a quick plug maker. So I'm wondering if you guys feel that in the air at all, or, or do you think that the craft movement is strong enough to sort of slow that, or anything is on that? Because even the ubiquity of, of, of classification is now being necessary for fire on age gin is a bit scary. Yeah, I mean, and, um, just quickly, I think, I suppose the difference way of the vodka boom was that a lot of that was, that, that wasn't so much led by the craft distillers, it was led by people that were just buying in spirit and maybe filtering it through platinum or, there wasn't a lot of substance there, I think that's kind of, I think that's kind of what I'm trying to say. Um, and, you know, there, some gins will, will, uh, Will not, you know, if you don't have a good business plan, then you'll just do really whatever the spirit is, it won't survive. But I think that was kind of one of the issues that there was with vodka. And there was, even as someone, you know, that quite enjoys vodka and tastes it and judges it, there's not as much of a range of vodka as there is in gin. And we only starting, certainly in the UK and more and more in the, in the US, we're starting to see more craft vodkas coming out where people are actually doing the distillation themselves. And that is a totally different product to what was coming out before, I would say. I mean, certainly the entries we had for this year's competition, I thought, wow, it's absolutely superb. Um, but yeah, I think that there's obviously going to be some point of it. I think as long as I've been involved in gin, which is about 10 years, people have always, always said, well, the bubble's going to burst in. And at some point, you know, something might happen, <coughs> but it's been like 10 years and everyone's always saying, the, there's just too many gins on the market, there's just too, well, there's 100 gins, there's too many gins on the market, there's six or 700, there's too many. And I know of like two or three that come bust, so. But that's my view, but I'm sure that there's still a thought. I think you will see the, uh, the category grow. And we all think, oh, gin's hot. It, within this whole convention, it is. But still, the overall gin is, was it, five cents the spirit sold? And it's, it's dropping en masse. You know, if beef, beef that drops one, one point, it affects, <laughs> it affects the industry a lot more than all of the rest of us going up ten points, you know, within our small margins. I think it will basically have a rise and then a decline. But by then we would have established a larger category and a more interesting category overall. I think vodka has had its day, but the, some of those flavors are going to stay around. You know, the peanut butter flavored vodka, and the and soul drink. <laughs> but anyway, it's here to stay, unfortunately. Timo, do you have a, as a, as a vodka producer as well? So. Um, well, yeah, we produce vodka. We actually produce our gin. We do everything from grain to glass at our distillery. So we uh, make our own vodka, which we then use as a base. Um, for our gin. 
Um, is it, it's a hard question, I don't think. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't really have an answer for that. I think, yeah, no, I don't <laughs> I have some opinions, but I really don't think that. Um, so we've probably got time for like one or two more questions. So the gentleman at the back. I'm kind of going to the marketing thing. This is, I want, I'd like a response to each one of the panel. Um, if you're in a situation, you step onto an elevator with someone that has never drank gin ever. How do you make them a gin drinker by the time you reach the age four? So it's like thirty seconds. Not something you're just <laughs> selling the concept of it. I, I know more about selling my gin than the gym category generally, but I think you can uh, remind them it's not you know just the pine bomb that grandma's bathroom used to smell of anymore. <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot more going on and it's worth revisiting. You know, everybody's got a spirit that they try to college week too much of it. I think it was just did last night actually. But you know, I mean oh God, I can't you know, drink gin again. I think you can explain to them, try a different one because they all have you know different things going on. Um, I've often heard gin um, when people say I don't like gin, um, I've heard some people describe it as sauce in a way, uh, in the sense that there are a million types of sauces. There's pepper sauce all the way up to chocolate sauce, and they, like everything in between kind of thing. Um, and gin is the same. Like gin is what the distiller wants to make of it. And so there are a myriad of different botanicals out there, and a myriad of different styles uh, of gins that um, that you can pick and choose from. So if uh, if one gin that you're tasting isn't exactly to your palate, I can bet there'll be another 20 out there that are. I think I read today in the Spirit of Business uh, news blog that a distillery in San Diego has just released a gin that has Mexican flavors in it. So it's all, um, it has all cilantro and interesting um, kind of flavors that we would associate with uh, Mexican food. Um, that's fascinating to me that we're taking gin in such diverse directions. So talking about the diversity of what gin can actually be is how um, I think you can sell gin to a non-gin drinker. Okay. I, mean, I have to agree with Colin, I'm probably better at selling my own gin than gin as a category. Um, and also I'm very rarely without a couple of bottles of the gin in my bag, so I'll probably just get it out if you <laughs> So my background is marketing, 18 years marketing, um, and I would, I think it's finding the parallel. What do they connect with? And oftentimes, I said it earlier, I think it's wines are really, the consumer understands the different complexities and different layers of wines, the different tastes that they can get of, out of a wine, and if you make some sort of parallel for them to gin, it starts to open their eyes to the category. Um, and I, I think the other thing that we have is an advantage that vodka and the rise and fall of vodka did not have, is that this is, this is natural. Um, everybody understands now what that artificial flavoring of whipped cream and peanut butter feels like <laughs> on your back of your tongue. Whereas gin is natural. As long as we keep that category and, and the authenticity of it, I, I think you've got a real potential to have consumers just embrace it. I would sort of say it's, it's, it's a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful palette onto which to project pretty much anything you want, all the major aspects of sort of the sensory aspects of taste. It's taste, it's aroma, it's mouthfeel. Um, and for those who you know, may not like the, the, the substrate from a lot of other spirits, I mean, you, you either like whiskey or you don't like whiskey as a category, you like tequila or you don't like tequila, same as rum, um, especially gins which start with a neutral sort of spirit base, you can really achieve a, a very wide variety of uh, things. There's a rich tradition to it. Um, uh, in terms of classic gins, and a lot of people like that. They like the feeling of, you know, drinking their gin and tonic, and you know, thinking of the Raj days or whatever. Or, or, but there's now a whole contemporary scene as well. So it's it's it's, it's versatility is I think the way I, I pitch it. Okay. Well, unfortunately, I think that's our our uh, time now. So I want to thank our distillers very much. Thank you.